to the volume, Rebecca Sear. And then we'll have uh, two talks which are, you know, not really intended as overviews, but I think were chosen by the co-editors of the panel to be a little more broad than some of the more specialized talks we'll get into later. And we'll have Bobby Lowe and then uh, Michael Gervin uh, speak. And uh, I did not prepare introductions for anybody. I apologize. <laughs> so I'll ask everybody just to briefly introduce themselves so we know uh, who, you know, what your current title is, what your current position is, and, and who you're speaking as. So uh, I'll let you do a better job than, than I would have anyway. So with that, uh, each speaker is going to speak for a, a, about 10 to 12 minutes. It should give us plenty of time. Uh, we're going to try something uh, that we did last week, which was have the speaker stop at some point during their talk and explicitly say, uh, I'm happy to take questions now for a minute or two before continuing, just to get a little bit of, of, of back and forth going while the talk's still going on. Okay, and so, uh, Ron, anything to add to the general introduction? Ron's eating, so I won't make it. So, take it away, uh, Rebecca. I think I'm going to be showing Rebecca's slides since she's reduced to a, a cell phone at this point. Let's see if I can do this. PowerPoint. Um, can people see that? Is that on the screen for you? Uh, and I probably need to make it bigger yes. because it looks like, there we go. Okay, so take it away, um, Rebecca, and just you know, use me as your puppet. You're, you're my marionettist, I'm your marionette. Just tell me when to go to the next slide. Thanks very much, Josh. Uh, I'm Rebecca Sayer. I'm a demographer and anthropologist at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I have my kitten Gatsby here with me, who is quite a purr monster, so you may hear her over me. I will try not to let her distract me. So I'm really delighted that Josh uh, wanted to use our volume as a seminar series, really very um, pleased indeed. So Ron Lee, Oscar Berger and I are editing a volume called Human Evolutionary Demography. We're doing so because we think that human evolutionary demography is a really exciting field and one that's very vibrant at the moment with some really exciting research coming out of it, uh, much of which is in our volume. All of these uh, chapters are now written except for our own introduction and they're available on the Open Science Framework so you can download all of them from OSF. The link is on the, the screen there. Uh, next slide, Josh. So evolution and demography have a very long history. Uh, Darwin was very famously influenced by Malthus when he was writing on the origin of species. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, the two disciplines were also very close together. Actually, you could go on to the next slide, please, Josh. Uh, this is a Google engram of the phrase evolutionary demography from 1859 when Darwin published on the origin of species. You can see just a tiny little blip uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, possibly that blip was when around people like Alfred Locker or Raymond Pearl were writing. These are people who moved pretty seamlessly between evolution and demography. And the phrase evolutionary demography probably wasn't used very much then because there wasn't much of a division between the two disciplines. People like Pearl or Locker moved very easily between the two. The disciplines didn't come together again until the late 20th century, however, after the Second World War, a lot of the, uh, the social sciences really moved away from biology, likely as a reaction to the eugenics movement in which biology, demography, most academic disciplines were implicated at the beginning of the 20th century. So after the Second World War, demography really situated itself in the social sciences, which as a whole rejected biology because of the, the taint of eugenics. It wasn't until relatively late in the 20th century that evolutionary demography started to emerge as a discipline. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, Josh. This was very much due to biologists and social scientists demographers realizing that the two disciplines are much stronger together. So on the slide here, you have Jim, Care uh, Jim Vopel, rather, who along with Jim Carey uh, did a lot to really uh, kickstart the discipline of evolutionary demography in the, the last decades of the 20th century. There's a quote on the screen here from Jim about how um, nothing in evolution can be understood except in the light of demography. So here he's expressing the opinion that demography is really key to evolution. Evolutionary biology is about how natural selection shapes traits, physiological and behavioral. Um, and the way that evolutionary biologists measure um, 
natural selection, the processes of natural selection is really through demography. It's through fertility and mortality. Often uh, fitness or reproductive success key to evolutionary biology is measured as a composite of fertility and mortality. Although demography is key to evolution, I'd also argue that evolution is key to understanding demographic processes. Understanding demographic processes is much richer. The only way to do that holistically is to recognise that our demographic patterns, our behaviour that results in demographic patterns, has been shaped by the processes of natural selection, just as our physiology and the demography of all other species. Have you gone to the next slide, Josh? So evolutionary demography today is thriving. There's a whole society which does it. Um, this society admittedly is mostly for non-human evolutionary demography, though arguably it is where a lot of formal demography is situated these days. Um, in the in human demography, a lot of it now is social demography. There's rather less formal demography. The the hard the hard core of demography, as Ron Lee has written about it before. Um, that is a, a much smaller part of the discipline than it used to be. Within evolutionary demography, formal demography, however, however really is thriving. Uh, go on to the next slide, please, Josh. Although the evolutionary demography society is quite largely non human evolutionary demography, there is also quite a lot of evolutionary demography which is applied to our own species um, going on today. And I would argue that there are really two branches of human evolutionary demography. One uses evolutionary theory to understand our species typical patterns of mortality, fertility and life history strategies. Uh, Ron himself has done some very important work here. A lot of this often involves uh, formal modelling of how our fertility mortality patterns have evolved um, and Ron's very influential work on intergenerational transfers um, has been very important in understanding why we have some of the, the life history patterns that, that we do. The other branch of human evolutionary demography, I would argue, is using evolutionary theory to understand variation in contemporary demographic processes. A lot of this is done by anthropologists, uh, some of whom you're going to hear from today. The example I've used here is a special issue of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society that I co-edited with some colleagues a couple of years ago on variation in human fertility, which uses evolutionary um, ideas and demography together to try and understand variation in human fertility. Though I should say that I'm writing the introduction to our volume at the moment, um, and I could very easily have used an example from, from Ron again. Something that really struck me when writing this introduction is that um, pretty much every example I want to put into this introduction, Ron has somehow worked on this. I think he really is um, the most important human evolutionary demographer working today. Uh, next slide, Josh. So the next two slides show you the list of chapters in our volume. Uh, it may be quite small on the screen there, but it's to give you a flavour of the, the breadth of work that is being done at the moment in human evolutionary demography. We have some chapters in there by people like Philip Krieger, um, who has written about the, the history of evolution and demography. Uh, Bobby, you're going to hear about shortly. Uh, if you go on to the next slide, Josh. We also have... Um, quite a range of other chapters in there, some of which involve formal demography, some of which are the second branch of um, human evolutionary demography, looking at contemporary variation and demographic patterns. For example, Heidi Colleran is writing about culture and evolutionary demography. Um, I really would urge you to take a look at, at these chapters online, they are all available. Um, I really have been quite blown away by the, the, the sheer quality of the work that people have submitted to this volume. Um, I really would like to thank all of our authors for contributing such fantastic chapters. Uh, I've really been extremely impressed by them. Uh, Josh, if you go on to the, the last slide. Okay, this is just uh, again to remind you that all of our chapters are available online. They do cover a real breadth of human evolutionary demography, which I hope will illustrate to you just how vibrant this field is at the moment. And thank you very much again, Josh, for inviting me. That's all I have to say. Perfect. Um, why don't we just, uh, people can ask questions right now if there are any general questions or specific ones for, uh, for Rebecca. If there aren't, I always have a couple of questions in, uh, at the ready. <laughs> but go ahead and just jump in if you have a question. Okay, so my question will be, uh, waited my requisite 1.3 seconds. Uh, my question will be, uh, 
what do you think of the changing um, uh, relationship between biodemography and its adjacent disciplines? Is, is biodemography becoming more of a silo? Are, are disciplines opening up more uh, around it? Uh, maybe you could talk uh, specifically about, say, the social sciences versus the natural sciences. I think that um, the social sciences, demography and other social sciences really are opening up more to ideas from evolution um, than they have done in the past. And I think demography is one of those social sciences which has been really quite open to the idea of bringing in evolutionary biology, likely because it is the most biological of the social sciences, the, the processes it deals with, fertility and mortality, they are biological processes. So I really do think there has been some opening up of the social sciences, particularly demography. Having said that, I, I don't think um, evolutionary biology is anywhere near mainstream yet in demography or other social sciences. I really think it, it should be because it's such an important component of understanding demography, but it, it isn't there yet. So uh, there's been some opening up, um, but not yet enough. I won't say anything about the natural sciences because I, I think I'm now too distant from that field to say too much about the natural sciences except that a few years ago Samuel Parrott and Jessica Metcalf wrote a paper that said uh, why all was titled why evolutionary biologists should be demographers so I would hope that um, work by people like Parrott and Metcalf and the Evolutionary Demography Society is opening up the natural sciences more to demography. Fantastic. Okay, so are you, I have not been checking the chat room. Let me, we, we usually do this by chat, but we're doing a slightly different thing today where we're going to ask people more to speak. Um, I actually can't even open my chat window. Let me just see if I can, are there things in chat? Can someone tell me if there are? No, okay. So uh, with that, thank you for that wonderful overview, um, Rebecca, as well as your personal uh, appreciation of her own Ron Lee. That's very kind of you. Uh, and now we're going to get closer to the heart of the matter uh, with uh, Bobby, who's going to start talking to us, not about meta uh, biodemography, but about biodemography itself. Okay. Take it away, Bobby. Oh, I I'm going to find... stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I need to close that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now that I'm not sharing, I see that we do have the chat up and, and we, let's try to make it um, active and we can draw questions from that also. Okay, so I actually wanted to share the sorts of information that led me to want to, to look at human demographic stuff besides the sex life of long dead Swedes. So everybody here approaches um, life not like this guy but like this guy all right and here's a generalization that's really obvious if you will in um in biology bobby uh, are you meaning to be sharing your screen right now or talking to us without your slides because you're talking to oh. us without your slides wait i thought i was sharing my screen I think well, you have, I see, there it is. Let me back up. <laughs> okay. So, um, huh. You can see you, so, you're on page three. Yeah, page. Yes, yes. So people in this group approach questions like this, right? Uh, not philosophically about what it's all about, but what does it get you? And this generalization is very old and widespread. The nastier, more brutish and short life is, the relatively earlier reproduction will occur. And that's, um, that's true if you, um, if you look, it's tempting. There's every, these are relative because there's African elephants on with meadow voles and mice, but it doesn't make any difference. If you look at 
primates, you don't have to transform in anything. And these are family averages for most of the primates and for the hominid, hominid knee, which is humans, chimps, bonobos, and gorillas. And orangutans are in the hominid D, but they're separate, not in our subfamily. So we fit reasonably, but here's where you get into oddities. So this again is humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. And you look first, the most striking things, of course, are that adult brain size is 40 and a half percent larger than you'd expect from our size. And life expectancy is about 22 and a half percent longer than you'd expect. All of, of the hominids have shorter reproductive, stop reproduction earlier than the typical. We spend a third of life, roughly average, um, after female reproduction uh, ceases, whereas other mammals largely spend about 10%. We have a gestation length, just what you'd expect from our size, producing nonetheless great big babies. But when they're weaned, when we wean our infants, ah, there I did it. When we wean our infants, um, they're much lighter and others help mom feed the kids. Let's see, yep. So obviously, biologists tend to calculate, give you an average for a species, and we all know that's not true. Um, within humans, you can see the variation, and these are, this is even an overgeneralization. This is chimpanzees. Gestation, we, um, nursing, weaning, interbirth interval continued. Um, but do you, do demographers still use how to rights as a, as a benchmark for, for natural fertility? Absolutely. Okay. They're kind of funny among humans in the timing, right? <laughs> They're almost never, women are almost never anything in this time period except pregnant or nursing, right? There's no break. Even the Swedes get a little break here. So- uh, Rob, Bobby, can I just ask a question? The, 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 white, the white bars uh, for the pan troglodytes, what is that? What's the mechanism for that? Um, they're neither pregnant nor nursing. They have they have an infant who still hangs around, though they're not nursing them. And daughters are different from sons. Daughters uh, will inherit their mother's rank. Sons will not. They're sort of on their own. So, so are, they not, they're not, are they not fecund or are they not having sex? They're not having sex. And they're probably, let's see, they're not even ovulating. They get a rest. My guess is that the pregnancy and nursing are expensive, really expensive for them in the wild. The, the interbirth interval is shorter in uh, captive populations. And it does vary. John Matani has data from several chimp populations in the wild, and, and they are different from each other. Not hugely, but is that good? Perfect, thank you. So my dead Swedes, women in most traditional societies, age at first birth is liable to fall somewhere between 18 and 22. <coughs> this young woman's wearing her dowry. So you know what you're getting when you, when you go to make arrangements. Now, HDI category, 
This is a, a UN uh, endeavor. This is Human Development Index. It's compounded education, life expectancy, and I always forget the third thing, and I'll think of it in a second. But um, these are best off countries, and uh, there, and they they have four ranks. Up until 2015, they only had three ranks. And in the little piece I wrote for Rebecca and Oscar and Ron, um, Rwanda and Chad were in a straight line here with a very much lower life expectancy. Rwanda's improved. The causes were different and age at first birth was quite different. Um, touchy, it's very touchy. <laughs> um, but Rwanda's life expectancy has uh, improved vastly. In the data just before 2015 data, the peak of, the, of this was New Zealand, which had a first birth age of 29 and a half. I'm sitting there going, whoa. Now that's not so unusual anymore, but historically it is. Anybody got questions on that one? So the US is here, and this doesn't this doesn't say a thing about um, about how unusual about religious uh, rules and that sort of thing. So it's very crude. It's also true that age-specific fertility varies. Here's life expectancy and the number of, uh, of nations in that category, uh, births per thousand women. And the only real, you know, these are smaller, but the shape of the curve is pretty much the same. But when you get to um, nations in which the life expectancy is greater than 75, you move age at first birth later. Now these data are older now, and this has probably changed. I'm gonna check them in the 2019 um, output from UNDP. We also often treat life expectancy as though it were some kind of constant, and it's very clearly not. We use trajectory analysis to look at how life expectancy changed over time in, uh, I think it was 175 countries. But the most notable oddities are this one and this one. And you all know what that is, right? Yeah. So it it's dramatic how it shows up that that uh, HIV made a huge difference in the patterns of fertility. So women in all sorts of nations are shifting to later and lower total fertility, that like men, their lives are more like men. This is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, the new head of Citibank and of Supreme Court Justice, right? And they each have children, but Jacinda is um, exceptional. You probably all know she had a child while Prime Minister. So, she broke the mold, it's really cool. So women's, traditionally in, in traditional societies, women's value to men was reproductive value. And for instance, in bride price societies, a younger woman commanded all else equal, a higher bride price than the same woman older. 
Um, and this has changed. We, I don't know, I'd love to know of this group, of the women in this group, who might be the oldest first birth mom and who might be the youngest because it's, it's the range isn't what it used to be. This is a famous quote and it's, it's just a reminder to me that Darwin, Darwin saw these things earlier than the rest of us. Um, when it takes more expenditure and parents must take greater risk, then you can't simply crank them out. Anthropologists at one point called, uh, named two strategies, the European strategy, which was wait, invest in kids, and the Mediterranean strategy, which was basically crank them out and let them find a job. So, the, the obvious point is the more you must invest in each child, absent getting bigger or richer, you'll have fewer children if the per capita cost is higher. And so this is where you start. Oh, isn't that interesting? Um, a, in traditional societies, Mike Gerben, you may, you want to flesh this out, you probably have much more, much more information than I ever will. Um, your resources as an adult, particularly male resources, influence the number of kids. Survivorship was not largely affected in most traditional societies by uh, parents' resources and it was fairly straightforward. Now, the pathway is use those resources to invest in offspring, in their skill, their growth, their health, education, which is, it makes a matter to adult offspring status and adult um, fertility. So women's fertility is shifting and we're entering probably another evolutionarily novel phase, I think. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bobby. Um, why don't we take a couple of questions that I've seen already in chat? Um, I, I, made a, I made a mark saying, stop here and ask for questions. That's no problem. But I'll just, I'll just, I'll just read out some of the things we've gotten. Um, one question uh, from uh, Bobby Shell is, uh, uh, Robert Shell is, uh, uh, what kind of data set would you ideally like to see? Uh, are, are, the Swedes, are the Swedes just right? So I'll read you what he, exactly what he wrote. This is a pretty basic question, but what kind of data set would evolutionary demographers want in a perfect world? How long, what information in it, et cetera? I guess my main question is how long dead do the Swedes need to be? Oh, I actually tried to get in, in Sweden, there's a moratorium. You can't get the data I used if it's less than 100 years old. And uh, I'd love to be able to follow changes, do this for people born uh, 1920s, you know, 1900 to 1920s. Um, the Swedish data are actually pretty damned good for all sorts of things. And it's kind of interesting because they were not gathered with any thought to the kinds of hypotheses demographers have. They, they were originally gathered so that Swedish school children could look up their lineages. And yet, if because they're in a, um, um, you know, like Oracle, where you can combine and resettle things. Uh, you can you can figure out how many kids each individual had as long as they didn't move out of the parish. Um, 
and follow lineages. I never got more than three generations, but um, that's better than I could find elsewhere. I think that the German data that John Nodell used were quite detailed and, and good. Um, Robert, is that, is that, uh, we would, we could have uh, marriages and when and to whom. It took a lot of merging of data sets uh, to make one flat file. And um, we could do deaths of children, deaths of parents. Um, we knew uncles and aunts, though I never did anything with those data and they might be important. Great, okay, so we're actually at um, getting towards time where we should switch to having Michael speak. Uh, uh, will you be able to stick around a little bit after one o'clock so we can take more discussion of this? I, I take, um, you know, part of the interest in my, I had a question too, is a little bit what uh, understanding the question about ideal data is trying to understand what is the question that you're trying to answer. And so we can talk about that, I think, even more um, at, at, uh, after, after one o'clock. So thank you so much, Bobby. Uh, Michael, uh, are you going to use slides? Uh, yes, uh, I'll try to share it right now. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're seeing the best slide of all. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, is that oh, work? Darn. Okay, well, we <laughs> like the first one even better. <laughs> okay, are we all ready? Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, great. Uh, great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, everyone, for, for organizing this. And I'm really happy to be part of this volume and, and to be able to present some of this work. Uh, and thank you, Bobby, for doing a lot of the background that I can skip. Um, I might have to skip a slide or two because I, I thought it, for some reason I thought it was 15 minutes, not 10 to 12. But um, all you're right. Just, you're just taking away your own time, your discussion. You're taking away your own discussion. Uh, okay. So. Well, yeah. So we live most of our species existence, right, as hunter-gatherers uh, 10,000 years ago, some the advent and animal domestication. Uh, and so if most of our species existence is very different than, you know, how we live today, if we want to understand lots of different kind of demographic processes, uh, especially I'm going to focus a bit here on aging, uh, you know, up through the, the turn of the, the 20th century, you know, less than 15% of the global population were living in cities. It's about 55% right now, it's supposed to be about 68% by 2050. And so something about how we live our lives now might not exactly be the same as how we've lived in the past. What's the same, what's different? And from an evolutionary perspective, the idea that our evolved genetic legacy might somehow be at odds with the current environments we find ourselves in now, uh, how we live our lives, not just in terms of what we eat and drink uh, or how we move our bodies, but also our social lives, that there's this possibility of an evolutionary mismatch. Uh, and so there's a, a prominent paper in the late 80s that kind of identified this, you know, are we just stone agers in the fast lane? Uh, and how does this affect our thinking about things like aging? And so now not everything is different. So from our best demographic data we have on hunter-gatherers and small-scale farmers, if you survive early life, then there's a good chance you'll make it into your 60s and 70s, that the, the body seems to last about seven decades across a wide range of uh, demographic uh, environmental uh, conditions, uh, including, Bobby, there's your, your Swedes uh, from the earliest, uh, from the human mortality database. Uh, thanks, Josh. And so uh, they all look pretty much very similar. So what's kind of motivated then my research over the last few decades is just how do we explain our evolved human life history? Uh, how flexible is our species typical rate? And here I'm focused on aging, on physiological aging. So moving from kind of actuarial aging to thinking about what's under the hood in terms of how our body works. And to what extent are aging related diseases common in subsistence populations? Uh, and one kind of advantage of working in a very distinct kind of uh, population that I'll, I'll talk about in a second 
uh, pathogen risk is much higher. So how, what's the role of exposure to different pathogens on different life course processes? And ultimately, what lessons can be learned about the natural history of aging by studying small scale subsistence societies? So that takes me to the subject of my chapter in the volume was basically like a whirlwind tour of the last few decades, uh, the Chimani Health and Life History Project. It's, it's almost uh, about two decades that we've been working there. It's about 16,000 forager farmers. Actually, the, the growth rate is about 3.8%. So every time I give a talk, I have to update the, the population size. Uh, so they're, they're close to Hutterites, not quite, but, but pretty close. TFR of 9.1. Uh, and we focus largely on things related to aging, infectious and chronic disease, and acculturation. There's a website. I post all the papers that you can, you can see. And just very quickly, it's uh, taken a lot of collaboration uh, in Bolivia, physicians, lab techs, uh, Chimane trained as anthropologists, as research assistants, and of course logistics. And stateside, uh, we started the project with, together with Hilly Kaplan up there on the upper right, uh, and then postdocs, many who are now faculty and grad students. So this is a shared kind of collaboration. So I'll put that up front instead of just at the last slide. Uh, this is not meant to be looked at <laughs> closely, just knowing that over the past two decades, we've collected a wide range of different types of information on living people. Uh, and this is of economic subsistence, sharing, social behavior, as well as biomedical, physical health, you know, functional status kind of information as well. Uh, and so rather than try to explain everything, I just want to highlight a couple findings over the years that have stood out that might be re directly relevant to topics of aging and maybe this audience here. And the first one, just that the Chimani show very little evidence of atherosclerosis, uh, starting with some risk factors. You know, we saw very little hypertension, not just in a cross section, but also longitudinally very minimal increase in blood pressure with age, uh, and no evidence of peripheral arterial disease as well. And then doing more involved study with thoracic CT scans, uh, we were able to look at all adults over the age of 40 uh, and look at the coronary arteries and see the extent to which there was calcification in the coronary arteries. So calc, the coronary arterial calcification, and basically the Chimani had the lowest levels ever observed from any population uh, observed as such. Uh, now it might not be that surprising given what I just said up above about hypertension and other risk factors, but they do have high exposure to systemic inflammation, low levels of uh, the good blood cholesterol and a couple other risk factors that might put them at higher risk. Uh, and so by some metrics compared here with the uh, US population, uh, you can come up with an arterial age. And so by the arterial age, the Chimani are like 20 years younger than their chronological age by the conditions of their coronary arteries. Okay. Now this was a kind of hit the news pretty big. Uh, actually, my biggest claim to fame is that Chuck Norris has commented on my research. Uh, so you know, why, okay, you've shown that there's very little heart disease, uh, but why? Is it, is it diet? Is it exercise? Is it you know, exposure to cigarette smoke or something else? You know, active social life with family? Uh, and we've been able to kind of piece this together over the years, you know, a combination of factors uh, from using Fitbits and looking at how many steps per day. The average Shimani adult has you know, about close to 20,000 steps per day. Uh, they're not vigorously active, but they're just not sedentary. So low, you know, low levels activity, moderate activity, minimal smoking, a diet that's fairly lean, uh, but no processed foods. So they have healthy protective factors like their bad cholesterol is fairly low, the blood pressure is low, the blood glucose is low. BMI, not super low, but, uh, but not very high. But if all, if all we learned was that they're physically active and eat well and don't smoke, that's sort of instructive, but it's not really telling us something terribly new. And so one aspect that's new is being able to look at the effects of infection and particularly worms, intestinal worms, we found have had some protective effects on uh, reducing blood cholesterol, blood glucose, uh, and also altering immune function in ways that seems to improve the regulation of immune function and uh, tamp down perhaps some of the effects of inflammation. 
And so that's kind of a very interesting area that we've been exploring more recently. And putting it all together seems to produce a pattern of minimal calcification in the coronary arteries throughout life. So the second uh, result I want to study, uh, I want to mention here, so apolipoprotein E4. Uh, Michael, yes. maybe we want to take a question on the previous results. Just oh. pause for a second. Yeah, sure. there are no questions, but we're just trying to encourage them. OK. Maybe I'll just ask a question here. Are you, are yeah. you seeing that the Simane as kind of uh, uh, typical of hunter-gatherer evolutionary context in general, or are you seeing it as quite specific? And then how does that apply to the helminth infections? Right. So, yeah, when I said that, you know, they had the healthiest hearts, you know, it's healthiest hearts of those who were under a CT scanner. You know, if I took any of those people that from that first slide and put them under a CT scanner, I do expect that they would have probably very similar patterns. So I do think this probably typifies uh, many hunter-gatherers, uh, subsistence sort of culturalists, and even some pastoralists. Uh, and so for some folks, that might not be terribly surprising, but it depends on what you think, you know, are critical factors. So the Chimane eat lots of meat, for example. Uh, lots of other groups, you know, eat plenty of meat, uh, and yet that's, that doesn't seem to be condemning. Uh, so, you know, so for the folks who are kind of the paleo diet, you know, this, this might be a bit surprising. Uh, they're, they're physically active, but not super physically active. So, you know, I do think that the, con uh, the confluence of factors seems to generate uh, these kinds of patterns. Now about the infection, I would actually probably surmise that the Chimani are probably overly infected, like more infected than probably, you know, hunter-gatherer uh, in the past may have been infected. Not so much the helmets. The helmets, I actually have there's good evidence, you know, as far back, you know, in mummies uh, in Peru and, and other areas, uh, Aleutian Islands, for example, that, that you know, there's evidence of, of helmets. And so they've been with us for a long time, whereas things like measles and other types of, you know, diseases that you see spread in, in more population dense areas are, are going to be more novel. So Michael, uh, Jim Carrey here. Hi. Yeah, hi. Did you, uh, <clears throat> was this on the parasite and heart disease, was this um, uh, just survey data or did, and, um, or did you do any control like eliminate parasites in one group? And uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, right, you can't introduce parasites, right? This is observational methods. Uh, and so we can't really do the ideal experiments. Uh, and what we've looked at so far was sort of comparative, uh, you know, like in, a, in, in cross sections, comparing people with and without infection and varying degrees of infection intensity. Uh, we do have now a sample though, where we eliminated parasites. And so you can at least do the, the contrast of the same individuals before and after uh, delivering anti-helminth medication. And we're looking at changes in uh, the blood lipids changes in different immune cytokines and other types of responses. And so those, on those levels, we actually do see the effects that after you eliminate the pathogens, blood lipids go up uh, and uh, immune regulation kind of gets a little bit disrupted. Um, we're in the middle of that right now, but that, that's the extent to which we're able to incorporate a more experimental design into our methods. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, full speed ahead. All right, great. Uh, so second, um, so apolipoprotein E4, you know, probably the, the single most, you know, deleterious allele in modern populations, you know, linked to uh, Alzheimer's disease and atherosclerosis, uh, and etc. And what we find is that it might not always have harmful effects. Uh, there were some precedents for thinking about this in, in a high infection context that it might have some protection for clearing bacteria. And so what we actually found was that when we tested folks' cognition through a variety of different tasks, and then we looked at their, the levels of infection that they have in a variety of different ways from you know, fecal samples and looking at uh, what species of infection of parasites people have, also looking at their white blood cells that are most clearly linked to having parasitic infection we basically find that folks that had the E4 allele 
uh, if they had high parasitic infection, actually did quite well in the, in the cognitive test compared to folks that had e, the E3, so the more dominant allele that's associated with less Alzheimer's risk, uh, when they were only when they were infected. So if you just look at the main effect, the E4 folks do worse than the E3, but when you kind of interact it with whether you were infected or not, uh, we saw this difference. And so it really, it leads, it's tentative information that says, hey, maybe deleterious alleles in modern context may have positive effects in more traditional conditions. And so that gene environment interactions might provide some insight why certain deleterious alleles are still with us today. Uh, and in the middle right now, it, there seems to be a big effect of E4 in fertility, uh, two extra children basically amongst, you know, adjusting for a variety of different things. Uh, and these analyses are adjusting for education and socioeconomic conditions and things like that, age. Um, so yeah, some potentially really interesting stuff uh, moving forward. Uh, how am I on time? I think I might just skip this yeah, other yeah, to say. Just two or th now would be a great time to wrap up. Yeah, all right. Well, so the last thing, because I'm in the middle, it's not in the chapter, but it's trying to put everything together. What's the best thing we can say, not about actuarial aging, but about physiological aging, putting all of our biomarkers together in a composite, uh, it's a Mahalanobis distance, you know, where you depart from the population average uh, or, or, or a healthy subset of the population uh, in, in, in n-dimensional space with all these different biomarkers thrown together. Uh, and we've been able to compare this with other species in a standardized kind of way. Uh, and once you have a certain number of biomarkers, it almost doesn't matter what they are. You pretty much get the same types of uh, slopes uh, with age and the same types of effects. And so this is actually in a volume for this audience should be really interested uh, uh, in a week. It's coming out philosophical transactions of the world uh, of society B uh, on primate aging uh, should be out, I think the, on Tuesday or Wednesday. And what you can do because we have uh, for a large subset longitudinal data on folks over time, you can actually look at the individual slopes and almost all the slopes are positive with age. So this is increasing evidence of dysregulation uh, with age, which is one kind of way of thinking about aging, uh, but they're quite variable. And so moving forward, we want to be able to understand within a population what predicts faster or slower rates of physiological aging, both in terms of the determinants of and also what that predicts down the road in terms of disease and death and functional status. So my last slide, take home messages from this kind of whirlwind tour, uh, aging and health span in high mortality, non-weird, so Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic populations is poorly understood, especially in the absence of chronic diseases. Uh, and so of course, more studies like the Chimani study, I think are needed, more comparative under different environmental conditions. And of course, longitudinal studies, any studies of aging or development need to be longitudinal. Uh, and what we're learning is that some things we thought were universal may not be, uh, and some traits that might be universal despite massive environmental change. We're learning that certain risk factors like, you know, C-reactive protein and inflammation, you know, they don't always lead to bad things. They may act differently across different environments. I mentioned that with APOE. Uh, we're getting some insights into adaptive function versus environmental mismatch. Uh, one novelty, it's not just diet, activity, and smoking, and genes, but also thinking about our infectious exposures, the microbiome, changes in fertility and breastfeeding, you know, following on the footsteps of what Bobby was talking about, and also changes in social support networks. How older adults are living in these, in Chimani societies, very different than, you know, how older folks live in our society. Uh, and how they're integrated into communities and loneliness and things like that. Uh, and then rather than just thinking of subsistence populations as these sort of like models of the ancient past, but the fact that these groups are changing rapidly everywhere and using that as a laboratory for thinking about the effects of changing conditions on health, on aging, is a really uh, ripe opportunity moving forward for evolutionary demography. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, so I, I'm kind of skimming the chat and I'm seeing a general uh, question kind of about your last 
that I think is, applies to your last slide and maybe to what Bobby was talking about, but uh, it's really the applicability of evolutionary thinking and these kind of studies uh, to what kind of variation we want to explain. So, I mean, there's kind of two directions on this one. We have a question from Nathan Seltzer mm -hmm. about if we want to study traditional societies, aren't the Swedes way too modern? Uh, I'm summarizing that. <laughs> um, and then I'll kind of go on, ask a similar question to your last slide, where uh, if we want to explain variation among non-Western societies, uh, maybe what you're showing us is interesting, but I think we get scared, at least I do, when I see these ideas being used to explain variation in Western societies. Uh, maybe that's just because uh, I think the things I know are more complicated, but um, maybe you could just talk about those two general issues. Since I sure you, you uh, bump into them all the time when you talk to social scientists. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, well, certainly no single population is representative of anything, right? The Hadza are not the hunter-gatherers, you know, the Kung are not the typical hunter-gatherers in all conditions. Uh, I mean, anthropologists love to do that, right? They, they, they point out a population that, you know, is the exception to every rule. Uh, so the, the larger lesson here, I just, it's just that if we want to understand something like aging, certainly a group like the Chimani has a bunch of exposures that are very different than what we see in, in many places around the world. And it's, a, it's, it's expanding the scope uh, of, of the human condition. Uh, so I, it's not, my first go-to isn't the Chimane represent, you know, the, the 1300s or the 1200s or, or anything, you know, kind of in a remote past, um, even though at the same time, it's a bit trying to eat your, have your cake and eat it too, that, they certainly are more similar to how we lived in the past. And so it's our best glimpse with living models. You know, what we can learn from paleo demography and from mummies, you know, is, is, is somewhat limited. Um, and, you know, an important lesson, you know, I know I went fast, but in that first slide, just the very fact that all those different populations, you know, under very different environments, you know, and under different diets and different exercise regimes, and including the Swedes in the mid 18th century, have almost identical mortality curves. And so, you know, I think that that raises interesting questions. It, it, in, in some respects, it doesn't matter that, yeah, maybe Swedes in the 18th century are as good a model as the Chimane are today for, for certain questions. Uh, so, you know, this, that, that's like kind of my, my, my short answer. You know, and I, I always do try to do it a little bit both ways where, you know, on one level I am trying to use the Chimane as our best kind of glimpse as an example of something more similar to maybe how conditions were in the past. Uh, but the departures are very interesting too, because they're not hunter-gatherers. So for example, you know, related to some of, you know, uh, Bobby and, and Rebecca mentioned Ron Lee's work on, on sharing and intergenerational transfers. You know, when you're a farmer and you're 70 years old, you can actually do quite a bit more productive labor than a hunter-gatherer who's 70 years old. So what implications does that have on the transfers that you expect to see on the conditions of late age? So it's using the existing conditions and variation, I think, in productive ways rather than just saying this group or this population represents the past. Um, I can't remember if there was more question that I didn't answer. <laughs> and that was that was that was great. Okay. Um, let, let me just follow up on the when, when you're doing this empirical work. Um, how does evolutionary is evolutionary theory just kind of um, rules of thumb, or are you actually using um, the kind of more formal uh, analysis in, in in generating predictions and things like that? Is there a clear distinction between the theoretical work that we find in this volume and say empirical work like yours, or do they actually come together in the same person? Right. Yeah. Well, the ideal marriage is right is 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 between both. You know, the the theory and the formal modeling and 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 the empiricism and uh, you know certainly in in a in a population working with living people. You know, I don't have the time depth that Bobby has. It would be so. So I can't ask certain questions that might require like eight, 10, 15 generations, you know, of, of data. And I think, well, I, that volume, like, I don't have that either. Um, and so the the level of 
uh, certainly within evolutionary medicine, you know, I would say some of what I do kind of falls under under that umbrella. Uh, you know, the 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 extent to which even um, let's see, uh, yeah, I would say that, you know the theory is is a framework uh, to so even taking you know some of Ron's work and other work on uh, the evolution of human lifespan. You know that uh, if if you think that there's important roles about um, about sharing uh, and what sharing should look like uh, in order to favor the evolution of of long lifespans, such that older adults uh, have uh, indirect fitness value, then you need to know there should be some limitations and structure on what sharing patterns should look like. If sharing was willy nilly given to anybody and not preferentially directed to kin, then it would be really, you know, Ron shows nicely that that's almost equivalent to the absence of transfers for thinking about the evolution of, of long life. So I, there's a nice marriage between the theory that can generate predictions that you could test uh, in living humans within, you know, even a single year study in terms of what people are doing on the ground. Uh, and so that's sort of, the angle we've been trying to push with this kind of with this kind of work. Okay, let me put some pressure on John Casterline, who visited us. Uh, do you want to ask a question, John? Uh, oh well, um, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in reproductive um, lifespan, um, uh, but I think maybe that's coming up later. Um, reproductive span, these kind of issues. Um, which Bobby touched on a bit, or Rebecca, but um, maybe we'll get back to that in a later session. Great. A, a new format for the brown bag, cold calling by the organizer. Uh, chime in, people. Chime in. So I have a question for Rebecca. <clears throat> uh, that is that given the um, historical focus on, um, you know, human evolution, that's uh, huge uh, area. What kinds of questions would be asked in the context of human evolutionary demography that hadn't been asked before, wouldn't be asked else if this new area didn't even exist? Uh, thanks. That's, a, that's an interesting question. And I might answer it by slightly answering one of the previous questions. So what not all evolutionary demography is interested in, um, in testing whether humans have evolved. Certainly the type of evolutionary demography that I do is not about testing whether humans have evolved. I'm not interested in looking at uh, genetic change over time. That's not really what the kind of evolutionary demography that I do is interested in at all. A lot of evolutionary demography, particularly the second branch that I talked about, is interested in explaining contemporary variation in demographic patterns, assuming that humans have evolved. Not testing that hypothesis, but assuming that. If we assume that, then what kinds of hypotheses are generated from that assumption that we can test against data to help explain contemporary variation in demographic processes? So I've done a lot of research on the family. How does the family impact demographic patterns like child mortality, female fertility rates? This comes from the idea that's now prominent in evolutionary anthropology that humans are cooperative breeders, that we have evolved a reproductive strategy where mothers need a lot of help from kin and other people around them to help raise their children. That's an evolutionary hypothesis, so it's uh, what I'm doing is evolutionary demography, um, but it helps to explain contemporary variation in demographic patterns. So do women who have more help have higher child survival and do they have higher fertility rates? Those are the hypotheses that I'm testing that stem from this idea from evolutionary anthropology that, that kin matter for um, reproductive patterns. And there, the work that I've done does show quite a lot of evidence that family do matter for both child mortality and female fertility. I think that is an example of where evolutionary demography asks questions that were not particularly common in mainstream demography. The family is, uh, hasn't been completely ignored as um, a factor affecting child mortality, for example, or female fertility, but it's not something that's been explored in very much detail at all in mainstream demography. I think that's one area where evolutionary demography has really contributed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, I actually think it would be profitable sometimes to call the sorts of things that Michael and you and I do as ecological demography, because you're looking at environmental influences on fertility. You don't know the genetic, well, you know some genetics, but I don't know any genetics of long dead Swedes. So I have a question of uh, Bobby uh, too. So, um, you know, you started out with a slide of the phylogenetic, uh, I mean, it was, what did you have? Chipmunks, a different uh, uh, right. species there with uh, timing of reproduction and so forth. But that's a, on an evolutionary phylogenetic scale. And then you uh, move to the humans, but isn't that, uh,